there are many faces I don't recognize in the audience, uh, so I think I'm going to just introduce myself as I did two weeks ago. I'm Ron Griffin, I'm uh, Professor Emeritus now at Pratt Institute, and uh, prior to that was the Director of the Pratt Center for Community and Environmental Development, now known as the Pratt Center for Community Development. Uh, and in that role, over the years, uh, I got to meet many of the really uh, great uh, activists within the city of New York that have been working uh, to better the lives of people in their communities, uh, and uh, based on that, also uh, developing the kinds of programs and interventions that they uh, tried the best they could to make this country a better country and the world a better world. And tonight, uh, it's going to be a great deal of honor to introduce one of the people uh, who has been a stalwart in the environmental justice movement who so graciously has agreed to moderate tonight's panel. Uh, but before that, I do want to uh, say a, a couple of quick things. Uh, uh, this series is part of a series of three public lectures, one that took place two weeks ago, uh, that is trying to take a look at the recommendations and the work and the struggle that came out of uh, the discussions in Paris uh, in December of this year uh, and uh, some of the activities that led up to it. Uh, and uh, we really wanted to focus on the intersection between climate change and what community-based organizations can and should do and what they have done to get us to the point where we are today, uh, beginning, to, beginning to look at of that issue in a fundamental way. What we really want to talk about and focus on is the relationship between climate change and poverty elimination uh, and social justice issues. Uh, and tonight, uh, we have a panel of people that represent local, national, and, uh, and statewide and regional efforts at really raising the consciousness of elected officials as well as mobilizing people on the ground. I don't think we would have had the, the limited successes of, uh, of Paris even if uh, it weren't for the grassroots efforts, not only in, around the world, but really in New York City and in uh, the People's Climate March. Uh, one of the key players in that uh, is someone I've known for a, a good many years. She's young, I'm not, but she, uh, I've known her uh, for a long time. And that's Elizabeth Yankier. Elizabeth has been an activist in the civil rights and the social justice and environmental justice movements. She's worked on intergenerational activities in her community in Sunset Park. And her resume, plus, or a brief resume, plus the resume of the other speakers are on the sheets of paper in front of you. Uh, most of all, Elizabeth has been a, a colleague, a mentor, friend uh, and someone uh, that I truly admire. And so I'm going to turn this lecture over to Elizabeth to uh, basically uh, describe and, uh, and take a moment to discuss what sadly you see on the screen before you. Uh, but Elizabeth, you want to come? Buenas tardes, mi gente. ¿Cómo se siente? How is everybody? Everybody good? It's nice and cold out there, warm in here. <laughs> Just don't get too hot. Right? Um, I want to welcome all of you for joining us tonight. I know it's a Friday night, and I can't imagine you being anywhere else talking about anything more important uh, than climate change. Um, and so tonight is a really important night because we've got three people joining us who I have tremendous respect for. But before we begin, uh, I want to say Kibae Berta Caceres, and I want us to take a moment to recognize the passing of Berta Caceres. Uh, Berta was um, an indigenous frontline warrior for climate justice, and she was assassinated two days ago. And it is a huge loss um, to the environmental justice and the climate justice community um, locally and globally. Uh, she, uh, I saw her just a few months ago, and I remember having that moment when you're in, in front of someone or you, you've met someone that just completely blows you away. Uh, someone that you know is courageous and is doing something that is powerful, uh, fierce, and transformational. 
And so it was really shocking to me and shocking to all of our community that she was murdered two, two days ago. So if we could just stop for a second and in whatever faith or no faith, maybe you just believe in the manifestation of energy, it's all good. Just send her a message so that we can send her with love to the ancestors who I know are waiting with loving open arms. So just one moment. Thank you. Um, so we're going to open up um, this discussion with a video um, that came out two years ago when we um, organized the, the People's Climate March. It's a very short video, uh, but it's called the PCM Wrap Up, and we will start right after that. So, Charles, can you put that up? Look at it when you have a chance. Uh, it's like two or three minutes. It's like it's two or three minutes. Hashtag badassery. It is a, a video that basically takes you from the front of the People's Climate March and really highlights frontline leadership, and it is really inspiring. And um, I want to say just a few words about the People's Climate March and some work that we did before then. Um, a few years ago, I was part of an initiative which is called the B. It's a Building Equity Alignment for Impact. And it was an effort to bring together the grassroots uh, funders and uh, philanthropy to, to align themselves to start <coughs> building just relationships so that we could start addressing climate change together. Over the years, there have been a lot of tensions between all of the different sectors in terms of ideology and in terms of approach, and certainly in terms of how much funding actually goes to a small number of organizations to lead the charge on climate change. But one of the things that we know for certain is that the path to climate justice is local, and that unless we address the, the needs of grassroots communities and grassroots communities lead, we are not going to be able to make a difference in this issue. One of the things that I always say is that the biggest obstacle to addressing climate change is privilege. And so the reason that I have invited these three people that you're going to meet in a second is that these are people that for me personify what just relationships are about. These are people that are working locally, statewide, and nationally to make sure that the grassroots is at the front of the climate change conversation that are asking the hard questions, that are moving agendas so that we can reduce not just carbon, but also co-pollutants, which are killing our people. Uh, and these are folks that are part of an intergenerational leadership throughout the country that are really redefining what the climate change movement looks like. And so I'm really excited that they've joined us. I'm, I'm, I'm honored uh, to consider them my friends. Uh, they know that I'm a pain. And so I'm always calling the question on privilege, um, but very few people step up, check themselves, and change their, their rhythm um, based on those questions. So uh, those people, though, I'm happy are part of a small group of people that are actually changing how we have these conversations and how we do the work locally. So that started before the People's Climate March, and so we were able to bring into the People's Climate March this idea of 
having a set of principles that would guide how, will we, how we would organize the largest climate march in history. And so the idea was to build a big tent that would bring people from different backgrounds, different walks of life, different ideologies together to send a message throughout the world that climate change is here and that it was important. But more than a march, it was an opportunity to create a groundswell of support, to basically a jump off, to let every community know in every barrio, every cada esquina, that climate change was, exists at the intersectionality of injustice and climate change, right? So people would be able to take climate change and integrate that into housing, into social services, into employment, into the criminal justice movement, whatever their struggle was, that was going to be impacted by climate change. And so in that respect, we succeeded. Now what's come out of that is a body of work that is all over the country. And you know, you know, a lot of people are hearing a lot about Flint and they're hearing about uh, things that are happening. For us, those stories are not new. We are the descendants of colonization and slavery, and we have been exposed to the worst air, the worst uh, water, the worst food for generations. For us, it's not a new issue. It's just that we are at that point, at that tipping point, where history is telling us that it's time to step up and it's time to take action. So I'm going to read to you a quote by Berta uh, that was selected by Ana Orozco. It says, Giving our lives in various ways for the protection of the rivers and of this planet, our Mother Earth, militarized, fenced in, poisoned, a place where basic rights are systematically violated, demands that we take action. There is no choice now, no, absolutely no choice, but for you to think about your life critically and think about where your life is gonna be 20 and 30 years from now, and think about what you're doing right now that you can pivot and start addressing this, this crisis of climate change. And for us, it has to happen from the grassroots up. And so that requires a certain number of principles and a certain way of approaching the work that is built on building just relationships so that we can actually turn this thing around and make sure that our communities are out of harm's way. So with that, I'm going to begin. Um, we have Ana Orozco from Uprose. If you can all welcome Ana Orozco from Uprose. Uh, Stephanie Edel from the Center for Working Families. Uh, Ray Bro from the National People's Action. Do you want to show the film now? Is it ready? Okay, I think I think the film's ready. Technology. 
March will take place two days before President Obama and world leaders attend a climate summit at the UN. Climate change will bring more extreme weather. Before I get into the specifics of the community where we do most of our work, I guess I'll start with uh, the title of this lecture series, The Road from Paris. What happened in Paris? What the fuck happened in Paris? <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of crazy. So the Paris Agreement, the Paris Climate Agreement, is supposed to address the climate crisis. It's supposed to propose how we can address the climate crisis, how we're going to slow down and eventually stop climate change. However, when you read the agreement, there's no mention of fossil fuels, oil, gas. What the agreement relies on is strictly cap and trade. And those of us in the environmental and climate justice movement know that cap and trade is a false promise. It's not at all a solution. So, we're left with the knowledge that we knew when you're going in. I don't think this in the climate justice movement, we didn't have super high expectations from the Conference of the Parties in December. But to see an agreement come out after these sorts of gatherings have been happening for years, and again look to false promises as solutions, is exhausting. We're tired of this level of disappointment. We have to talk about real solutions. We don't have time to entertain false promises. We don't have time to entertain <coughs> solutions proposed by the very people who are causing the climate crisis to begin with. So we're working on solutions on the ground. We're working on solutions locally. Um, in Sunset Park, for those of you who are not familiar with the neighborhood, it's a low-income community of color. It's predominantly Latino and Asian. It is one of the last working waterfronts in New York City. It is an industrial waterfront. And while the sort of industry along the waterfront does contribute to the environmental hazards that we who live and work there are exposed to on a daily basis, it also holds a lot of promise and opportunity. It's a place that offers a lot of jobs to people who live in the community. It's the largest walk-to-work community in New York City. So when we talk about transitioning away from the fossil fuel economy, we can't talk about that movement or that transition without thinking about jobs to offer as alternatives. We can't talk about transitioning away 
from the dig, burn, dump economy without talking about solutions. What does the future look like? We know what the problem is. What are real solutions? So we see Sunset Park as an opportunity, a place to become a leader in the clean energy industry. It's already an industrial waterfront. It's already a place that provides lots of jobs to a working class community. Good jobs where people are able to provide for their family and, and get by. We'd like to see those jobs transition into clean energy jobs. We think that with jobs training for people who live and work in the community um, is what we definitely need. It's a place where we can make solar panels. It's an opportunity to have offshore wind. And we think that those sorts of jobs should go directly to community because we're also the community that's most affected by climate change, not just Sunset Park alone, but low-income communities of color locally, nationally, and globally are always the ones affected first and worst by climate change. Therefore, we're the leaders of the climate justice movement, and we're the ones who know the solutions firsthand. We know what we need, and we also know what we can offer. So I'll leave it at that because I think that we'll have an opportunity to engage in a conversation. So I have a lot more to offer, but I want to um, give some time over to my co-panelists and hopefully we'll start a really good reciprocal conversation about real solutions. Thank you. Thank you. So Stefan, I'm sorry. Oh. So Stefan uh, works for the Center for Working Families and is part of New York Renews, which is a statewide campaign. Stefan, sorry. No, thank you. <coughs> I'm honored to be here. Uh, Pardon me if I cough, I have a little bit of a cold. I'm trying not to give my co panelists So mainly what I'm going to talk about is New York news. And, and I want to talk about it in the context of the panel. Right? We're coming out of a moment where Paris laid out a challenge. Right? It failed to offer a real tool to address that. Where the government in Washington is almost guaranteed not to act. And where we're facing a whole array of challenges. Right? We can't talk about climate change without talking about inequality. We can't talk about inequality without talking about climate change. <clears throat> and we can't talk about both of those things without talking about how we actually make a transition to an economy that serves people rather than profits. The New Yorker News is part of a much bigger conversation. I imagine all of you know many of the things going on in New York. But I think it's worth situating us in the fact that we have an infrastructure, right, as we saw in Flint, that is literally killing people. It is under-resourced, it's underemployed, and it's falling apart. That includes the energy sector. And so there's a huge opportunity there as well as a huge burden. And it means that we have to sort of think about what comes next. Right? Not just because of climate change, because literally buildings are exploding in Manhattan about twice a year because the gas mains underneath are aging.